So it's very important. And then also your children uh, having an environment of love in your family, in your house. Your children should feel love. You want your children to be in an environment of love. The Prophet ﷺ kissed his children, he hugged them. He, and we know that touching, children need a lot of touching. They need a lot of uh, tactile stimulation. If you don't give them that, they actually suffer from it. We also know a lot of sociopathic behavior is the result of maltreatment when they were children. So it's, it's very important to have a lot of love in the house. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about a hadith before I go on to the next chapter. A hadith that Imam Tabarani relates, and it's, it's from Sayyidina Ali, and he says that the Prophet said, أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادُكُمْ عَلَى ثَلَاثِ خِصَالِ Discipline your children or raise your children with three characteristics or qualities. And then he said, حُبِّ نَبِيِّكُمْ Love of your Prophet Hubbi Adi Baytihi, love of his family, Watirawat al Quran. And then he talked about the, the maqam of the Hamarat al Quran on the Day of Judgment. But if you look at those three, he said the first one is loving the Prophet. Now you have to. I'm always amazed that the, like the women always have their notebooks and pens and they always write. The men, their memories are amazing. <laughs> I just, I just, subhanAllah. Yeah, it's just, it's beautiful, man. You have to thank Allah, you know. These poor women have to write down things they hear. The men just, mashallah, it's all osmotically absorbed. You know? They don't even have to listen, you know. It's just, it's just going in, you know. It's, just their, their, their pores are open to knowledge and information. It's just wonderful. It really amazes me. I've seen that over the years so many times, you know. They're taking over, you guys. You're just all sitting around watching it happen. I'm serious. You know, we're going to be in those caged <laughs> things before long. You know? with the crying babies. <laughs> the women are going to be on the other side. It's, it's, it's happening, you know. Seriously, because we'll all be so dumb, you know, that nobody will know the ahkam, and the women will just say, no, no, the men are supposed to be in that caged area <laughs> over there, you know. Rawa <laughs> al-Bukhari. Oh, yeah. Seriously, if they wise up, they're going to find out, my God, I did all the... Really? We don't have to do that? We don't have to do that? We don't have to do that? <laughs> they've been full 1,400 years, they've been tricking us all this time. Yeah, where's my servant? <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> you know, and then you're going to have to have two jobs. <laughs> and don't expect dinner when you get home. Because <laughs> she doesn't have to cook either. That's why you better love them, you know. <laughs> yeah, make your own dinner. Yeah, anyway. So, where was I? Yeah, loving the Prophet ﷺ. Raise your children to love the Prophet ﷺ. You can do that, in, there are different ways to do that. One of them is really reminding them of the blessing of the Prophet ﷺ. Because so much in your life, is from the Prophet ﷺ. So many of our blessings, we don't think about it, but so many of our blessings uh, are from the Prophet ﷺ. And so you remind them of that. And then also telling them the stories of the Prophet ﷺ, what he did for them, inculcating in them that love. And then doing things that Islam is a sweet. You know, you, you take your kids, one of the things that really troubles me in the U.S. is people don't take their kids to Jummah. You know, they're, they're uh, young, teenage, you know, they should be going to Juma from about 9, 10 on to get that experience. They don't do that. They're in school, whatever. I take my boys to the Juma, and I watch, like, my little, my 8-year-old, he's just like, it's so intense to watch him because he's really listening, you know, and then we go out and we talk about it. We went to the Juma, and this man gave this talk about... <laughs> about this uh, mosque in India that the Hindus claimed the land was theirs, the Muslims claimed the land was theirs. 
and there was a fight and so there was one righteous Muslim in the town and both the Hindus and the Muslims agreed that, um, that they would allow him to arbitrate between them because they, they thought he was fair. And so then the Imam's telling the story and then he says, and then, you know, the suspense, when the Imam decided who had the right, it was the Hindus. So my little eight-year-old looks up, I said, I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> you know, like he knew that he was going to be fair. That was the whole point of the story. So he got the point. And then we're on, on the way home, he said to me, you know, I think there was a better solution. So I was like, what was it? He said, he should have split the land and then the Hindus could have had the one half, the Muslims, the other half, they could have each built their places of worship together. And uh, so you underestimate, you know, the power of children and their capacity to understand things. You know, they really, children are amazing. And, and they're very spiritual. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a book uh, by w uh, Chilton Pierce, worth reading for mothers, which is called The Magical Teen. And one of the things that he argues in there is that the most spiritual period of a person's life is their teenage years. And, and what he says is our society gives no way for children to experience that. In previous cultures, even if you look at the Native American culture, they had vision quests at very early ages to find out who they were. They took them out into the uh, wilderness and they would go through this spiritual quest in, into puberty. In the uh, Jewish tradition, you have the bar mitzvah where you come in of age spiritually. You have to learn a certain amount of the Quran. In, in, in the Indo-Pak culture, they had the khatam was a very important uh, a hallmark for a, a young person's development, religious development. There were ways in which people were, their spirituality was encouraged and enhanced. So it's very important to do that with children. But, you know, take them to Juma. You know, I take my child, I like to take my children to the Juma. And then I usually take them, like, somewhere they want to go afterwards on that day. So it's a special day. So they look forward to Juma. It's something they look forward to. And then also, Ramadan is a very opportune time to really inculcate these virtues. And then doing prayer on the Prophet ﷺ. Even a little bit, if you just do after the prayer, like the Moroccan tradition, they always do Salah and nabi after they finish the prayer. It's good to do prayer on the Prophet. Remind them about the Prophet. And then embody his character. Really try to embody the character. Your children are one of the great sources of your own spiritual development if you take it seriously. Because children are teachers. They're also, they test our patience. They test us in all those things that we're told to practice with other people. Children test us with that. And vice versa, for children, they're tested by their parents. So it's something they also need to learn uh, to deal with. So there's a lot that you can do. Loving the Prophet is very important. Knowing his story, knowing where he went, taking your children to Mecca and Medina, taking them to these places, letting them see. Uh, it's very exciting for them. You know, uh, my young, my eight-year-old was so upset today that he didn't get to go to these places because uh, my wife woke him up, and he, and he was like, he was so tired from yesterday. She woke him up, and he's like, she said, it's time to go, and he just went back to sleep. And then when he woke up later, he said, did they go? And she said, yeah, why didn't you wake me up? And, he, and she said, I did. You went, he said, no, you should have thrown water on me. I mean, that's how, you know, he really wanted to go. So you, you can't underestimate the impact that these things have on young people, even at a young age. My most profound experience as a child growing up, when I was 12 years old, my mother, we went on a Sierra Club hike into the wilderness for 10 days. And we had to prepare, we had to learn all this stuff, we had to, we did preparation with backpacks, we had to go every weekend just walking up this Mount Tamil Pius with, with National Geographics in our backpacks just to get used to carrying the weight. But it was, I, that experience to me, I can almost, tell you everything that happened on that journey because it was, it was a discovery for me of being out in the wilderness, of what nature was like. And we went to this place called Crystal Lake, which takes three days to hike to up in the mountains. There's no roads to it. It's a beautiful lake in California. We swam in the lake, uh, crystal clear water. And, and the, the, one of the counselors, our counselor, was in, this is in the 70s. He was a staunch environmentalist because my mother was into the environmental. We were, we were doing recycling in the late 60s. 
I'm not making this up. And that's how my mother was just always ahead of the curve on those type things. And she would bundle. We had biodegradable soap in our house uh, in, in, in the early 70s. My mother wouldn't do anything, you know. She was, and she used to, we had to bundle all the paper. We hated it, you know, as kids, you know, it's your mom. And, uh, but later I just really, really appreciated, because what, what my mother taught all of us, I think, and what we really recognized in her, was my mother was never a talker. She wasn't the type of person that gave speeches, or she actually just did what she believed. And we saw it in her actions. She was civil rights. She was out there marching. It wasn't like we should have integration. She took my sister and drove her to an all-black school before they integrated in the early 60s. I, we, we've got my sister's yearbooks. She's the only white face. They're all black. I'm not making this up. And my sister was traumatized by it. It was very difficult for her to do that because it was Marin City, it was an all-black environment, and most of the people there did not interact with white kids. So my sister was the only white kid in this whole school, but my mom believed in integration. She just thought, she, you know, her mother was from the South, her mother left the South because of the black and white, in the 30s, my, my grandmother. She, she uh, married, moved to San Francisco, uh, she came out with her brother. They left the South because they didn't like the, uh, the, the whole way the South functioned. They went to the most progressive place in America, which at that time was San Francisco and probably still is. But that's, she lived those things. My mother always lived those things. Those had a big impact on me. Part of, you, a large part of my whole view of the world came from my mother. So you can't underestimate the impact that mothers have on their children. And also the spiritual openness to things. I was very open to those things as a youngster and curious about these things and why they were doing these things. So those type of things you can do with your children just to inculcate that love in them. And then the other thing he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the love of his family, which is very important. The family of the Prophet ﷺ is obviously the al-bayt is the, the uncles of the Prophet Hamza anhu, Sayyidina Hamza. We go visit him, honor him, the shuhada of Uhud. And al-Abbas, Aqil, who's Sheikh Abdullah al-Qadi's grandfather. All these people, we honor them and love them. And then their children, and then the children, Ja'far, the cousins and their children, Al Ja'far, you know, last night I was with five or six of them, you know, just from Al Ahsa, they're from Al Ja'far. And you should love them because they're the children of the Prophet's family. And, and anybody who has intisab, many people have intisab. Some people look at it like, how's that possible? Well, it's very easy. The majority of people on the earth, according to Khalid Bangshi, probably have some blood from the Prophet even the non-Muslims. Queen Elizabeth claims it in her lineage. John Kerry, if, if you look at peerage, Bird's peerage, John Kerry has, uh, the man that ran for president, he has blood from the family of the Prophet through a Persian connection. So a lot of people have blood. But descendants are people that have a lineage directly to the Prophet with a tree. Now, there are people that don't have that. I mean, they, they, they have trees, but they're not real. That's true, because it was a very prestigious thing. So you find that. But what I've noted is that people, there are people that have firasa and can see the family. And I've seen this many, many times. I really have. I'll give you one example. There's a man in Mauritania, Muhammad Zain, who is a sharif, very spiritual man really amazing scholar, lives out there. He's the only person I've ever seen Marab al-Hajj actually get up to greet and when he comes to visit. 